We continue this morning with our study of the gospel according to St. Mark, and the text for the day is a brief one. We're still in chapter 12, and I will be reading from verse 35 through verse 37. That's Mark 12, 35 to 37. I'd ask the congregation to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Then Jesus answered and said while He taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the Son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. I believe, dear friends, that that brief text that I've just read for you is one of the most profound texts found anywhere in Scripture. Indeed, to preach on it in one sermon is almost blasphemous, because it would take many, many weeks to touch deeply on all that is contained within this text. But I pray that this morning you will hear what the Word of the Lord says, and as the common people in Jesus' day, receive it gladly. Please be seated. Let us pray. Help us, O God, to begin to probe the mystery of the things that are set forth in this important text. If we ask it for our sakes and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I had a professor once in seminary who used to talk about a strong Christian apologist whom he said that when he was engaged in debate, he would not only win the debate, he would not only annihilate the position of his opponent, but that when he was through with him, he would dust off the spot where he stood. And that graphic imagery of that kind of sound victory in debate has stayed in my mind, lo, these many years. And I couldn't help but think of it when I came to this portion of Mark's gospel, because we've just seen the threefold interrogation to which Jesus was subjected first by the Pharisees and Herodians, then by the Sadducees, and then by the scribes, which we have already considered. And these groups sought to entrap Jesus and, of all things, to defeat the very incarnation of truth in a debate about truth. If any adversaries of truth were annihilated in debate, it was these groups, and indeed, Jesus dusted off the spot where they had stood. Not only does He win the debate, but now He seizes the arena of the debate, turns the tables on His adversaries, and now He becomes the interrogator. He becomes the one who subjects profound theological questions to them, where He said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Now, let's just look at that for a second. The first part of the question is, why do the intellectuals, why do the theologians, the rabbis of Israel come to the conclusion about their expectation of the coming Messiah, that He would be the Son 
of David. Now, most of these people were well aware of the manifold texts of the Old Testament that predicted that the coming Messiah would be from the line of David, that he would be a descendant of David, that he would be born in the city of David, that he would be of the seed of David. If you go back for a moment to the pages of the Old Testament, we realize that Israel's most illustrious king was King David. He extended the boundaries of the nation from Dan to Beersheba, was the greatest military genius of their history, had the finest public works program of any king that ruled over the Jewish people. He was a man who was a shepherd, a poet, a brilliant administrator. He personified the greatest statesman of that world historical error. And so the reign of David was considered by the Jews to be the golden age of Israel. And we know what happened upon the death of David, where his kingdom was inherited by his son Solomon, that under that reign of Solomon, with all of his wisdom and at times the lack of it, the golden age of Israel began to be tarnished a bit, and then by the next generation, the kingdom was divided between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and that glorious golden era turned to rust. And the decay continued. It got worse and worse as corruption penetrated every dimension of the monarchy of both the north and the south. And so the people longed for the good old days, the days of the golden years under David, and God gave them the promise that the fallen house of David would be restored, and that the monarchy promised to David would be a kingship that would last forever. So in generation after generation after generation, the Jewish people pinned their hopes for the coming Messiah who would be the son of David, one of David's descendants. And so Jesus goes on here, how is it that they say that the Messiah is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Let's look at the beginning of this quotation where Jesus said, David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, just in passing, let us notice the Lord Jesus Christ's view of sacred Scripture. He did not regard the lyrical poetry of David the musician and literary giant of antiquity as a man just simply uniquely gifted with what we call artistic inspiration. But when he quotes from the psalm, he says that David said what he said and wrote what he wrote by the Holy Spirit. Again, throughout the Old Testament and through the teaching of Jesus, those who were God's spokesmen spoke not by their own energy, but under the supervision and influence of the Holy Ghost. Keep that in mind. We're living in a day which the past prime minister of the Netherlands and founder of the Free University of Amsterdam, Abraham Kuyper, once remarked that we live in a time not simply of biblical criticism, 
but of biblical vandalism, where every conceivable hostile attack against the normative authority of the Bible has been launched in the last 100 or 200 years. And so, those who continue to hold to an inspired text of Scripture in many circles are considered backwood fundamentalist theological obscurantists who have no academic or scholarly credibility. Uh, we say, as Luther said to the skeptics of his own day, spiritus sanctus non est skeptitus, the Holy Spirit is not a skeptic, and that which he declares is more certain than life itself. Our Lord had no problem with the doctrine of the divine inspiration of Scripture, and neither should we. I mention that simply in passing, that Jesus says that this affirmation by David was by the Holy Spirit, that David's testimony was the testimony of the third person of the Trinity. It was a divine assertion and a divine affirmation, and he is now quoting what David wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a portion of the text of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Again, this is a quotation directly from Psalm 110. You may be surprised to learn that Psalm 110 is the most frequently quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament. To say it another way, there is no other statement found in the Old Testament Scriptures quoted more often than the text of Psalm 110, including direct quotations and allusions the New Testament refers to Psalm 110 no less than 33 times. Now, I've already said to you that this text is so rich, so profound, that it is worthy of much more attention than I can possibly give it this morning. And when I just mentioned to you that the New Testament writers referred to it 33 times. They clearly understood the gravity of what I've just asserted, how important this text in the Old Testament is to understand the person and work of Jesus. When all of the debates are over, when Jesus has answered all of their questions, now He drags His adversaries to this text, the supreme text of messianic expectancy among them. And he said, notice what David is saying about his son, the son that you are expecting as your Messiah. David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord. There's the first part of the conundrum. Here you have the Lord, and in the Old Testament, it's Yahweh having a conversation with someone who is given the title Adonai, or Lord, which is strange enough because in most cases in the Old Testament, whenever the title Adonai is used, it is used to describe an office or a title that belongs to Yahweh. Go back to Psalm 8, for example. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all of the earth. The text reads like this, O oh Yahweh, our 
Adonai. Now, those of you who were here Wednesday evening, this past Wednesday evening for the first of our series of lectures on the holiness of God, I hope will remember that in Isaiah 6, the word for Lord is found in two ways. First, it is spelled out capital L, little o, little r, little d. When Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and then later on in the text, the reference to the Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And you will recall that I pointed out to you that in most cases when the Scriptures refer to God as Lord with all capital letters, that is the English translation of the sacred name of God, the memorial name, the ineffable name, the name by which God revealed Himself to Moses in the Midianite wilderness when He said, I am who I am. And that has been translated into the term Yahweh. That's His name. It's not His title. The supreme title that is given to God, which is translated in English by capital L, little o, little r, little d, is the title Adonai, which means the one who is absolutely sovereign. So in Psalm 8, we read, O Lord, or O God, our sovereign, how excellent is Your name in all of the earth. Now if we come back to this text, Here, we have Yahweh calling somebody else Adonai. That's enough to cause us to scratch our heads, isn't it? Well, who is it who is addressed in this psalm by the Lord God omnipotent as Adonai? It doesn't say the Lord said to Himself, Adonai. Rather, it says, the Lord said, and David is writing this, to my Adonai. Now, who is David's Adonai? Who is sovereign over the king of Israel? In Hebrew categories, that would be God. And so it would seem that God is having a conversation with Himself about David's Lord, about David's sovereign, about David's Adonai. So the Lord speaks to somebody else who is identified in Psalm 110 as David's Lord. And Jesus is saying to these scholars, what do you think of this? What about this? What is the Holy Spirit saying? Well, what is it that the Lord said to David's Lord? Sit at my right hand. Dearly beloved, when we go through the biblical narrative of the work of Jesus, there are special moments in the life and ministry of Jesus that we extrapolate and associate with supreme importance in terms of redemptive history. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, don't we? We take very seriously the death of Jesus at the cross, which is so central to our salvation. And then at the end of Holy Week, we join in great joy and glory celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And we celebrate the day of Pentecost, and we're almost preoccupied in this day and age with respect to the return of Jesus. But there's an element in the work of Christ historically that is almost completely forgotten among us. And it's what is called 
the session of Jesus. Now, you know that in the polity and the governmental makeup of St. Andrews, we are ruled by a body of elders that we call what? The session. Why are they called the session? Because when they meet to deliberate, to establish policy, to give supervision to our spiritual lives, they don't meet standing up. <laughs> they sit down and discuss these things, and that's what session simply means, a being seated. When we say that Congress is in session, we mean that our representatives are assembled and they don't stand all day, though many of the decisions are made in the cloakrooms. The votes are taken while they're in their seats. Now, the most important session of all time and of all place is the session that is seated in heaven. And what Psalm 110 says is that Yahweh says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand, which means be seated in the highest place of authority in the universe according to my delegation. And the point that this prophecy gives to us is that the Messiah who is to come, after He finishes His labor in this world, will be exalted into heaven, taken up into heaven in ascension, and enthroned at the right hand of God. We say it every time we say the Apostles' Creed. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into heaven, then what? And sitteth on the right hand of God. That is a confession of faith of the early church to the importance of the session of Christ. What does that mean for us now? What did it mean for the church in the first century? It means that Christ has been enthroned in the highest seat of political power and authority in the universe. We pride ourselves in living in a democracy or a republic, but as Christians, we do not reside in a democracy or a republic. We live in a kingdom where we have a king who has been enthroned already, that He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And that reign is not something that's going to take place in the distant future, but it has started already. Jesus is our King this morning. I said before that one of my favorite stories of all time is Robin Hood. I love it. I keep on my TiVo the Earl Flynn version of Robin Hood, but I love the story. You know the story. Richard the Lionheart has to leave his country, has to leave his realm, his domain, because he's going off into a foreign battle to try to defeat the Turks and liberate Jerusalem from the infidels. And he goes off on the crusades. But while he's gone, wicked Prince John takes charge of the realm. And anybody who wants to be faithful to Richard is banished as an outlaw, and Robin and his men live in the forest trying to escape the wrath of the corrupt Prince John. You know the story. 
Robin Hood's men are called a band of merry men. They're known for their joy, but they're also known especially for their loyalty. And what they wanted to do was to protect the realm until their king came home. My favorite part of the story is at the end, where Richard returns to England, but he's disguised in the garb of a monk. And he's seated in his disguise in an inn, and he hears people talking about this Robin Hood and and Prince John and all that's going on. And so, on his way back, he travels through Sherwood Forest, remember? And all of a sudden, out of the trees jump Robin and the merry men, and they stop this group of monks, and Robin tries to relieve him of his purse. And uh, his face is hidden, that is, King Richard's face is hidden from Robin Hood, and, and he says to Robin Hood, why are you doing this? And he said, because of my loyalty and my allegiance to my king. And then Richard pulls apart the monk's garments and displays the lion and the cross on his chest, throws back the hood, and instantly Robin recognizes him and falls on his knees and says, my liege. And then in the final moments, Richard knights Robin Hood, Sir Robin of Loxley, because of his faithfulness during the absence of the king. You see why I love that? As a metaphor for the church, our king is already seated on the right hand of God. But he's gone to heaven temporarily. In the meantime, he looks to us, to his people, to remain loyal to him when the whole world goes for Prince John. But our king has been seated at the right hand of God. The author of Hebrews makes much of this when he writes of the supremacy of Jesus, where he says, in chapter 1, the end of chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Earlier in that same chapter, he cites elsewhere, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Who is anointed? Again, it is to the Son that these words are spoken. Wonder you then why the New Testament would have 33 allusions to Psalm 110 which gives us such a magnificent view of the unique, transcendent majesty of Christ, who is the Messiah. But the point is that, yes, the Messiah will be the son of David, but in Jewish categories, the son is always subordinate to his father. The Son is never greater than the Father. And so you would expect as marvelous as the Messiah would be if He is David's Son. He cannot be greater than David, but David himself, Jesus says, under the guidance of the Holy Ghost, calls His Son His Lord. So that Jesus is not simply the son of David, he is David's sovereign. He is David's Adonai. He is David's king. 
before whom even David must bow. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. Again, as I mentioned Wednesday night, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, in chapter 2, he writes what is called the canonic hymn, where he enjoins the Philippians to have this mind among you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And even though he was in the form of God, took his equality with God not as something to be prized, to be jealously guarded, to be grasped, to be held onto, but he emptied himself, not of his deity, not of his attributes, but of his prerogatives, of his glory, and took upon himself the form of a servant, a slave, and he became obedient even unto death. You know the text. And Paul comes to the conclusion, wherefore, that is because of this, God has highly exalted him and has given to him the name that is above every name. Listen to Christian hymnody. Listen to the spiritual songs, the praise choruses, and they all celebrate the name of Jesus as the name that is above every name. No, 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 no. Paul says that the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, and every tongue confess, not that He is Jesus, but that He is Adonai, that He is Curios, that He is Lord. That's the supreme title. That's the name that is above every name. The name that is reserved for God in the Old Testament is now given to His Son, who now is called Curios Curion, the Lord of the Lords, the Sovereign One, whom God has seated at His right hand. Think of the implications of that. Think of the implications that Jesus has been given this name. And the giving of that name was foreshadowed already by the Holy Ghost in Psalm 110 when Yahweh speaks to David's Adonai, when the Father speaks to the Son. I have prepared a throne for you. Sit at my right hand until I make all of your enemies your footstool. He may tarry in a foreign land, but he has never lost that authority. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the glorious message of the session of Christ at Thy right hand, that our Messiah is nothing less than Your eternal Son. Amen.